Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this beautiful Tudor Oyster Prince 34. Uh, that's not the year, by the way. That's the diameter of the case. The year from of this watch is in the 1950s. And of course, this is manufactured by Tudor, which is kind of like the smaller company associated with Rolex. And you can often get similar quality uh, movements and, and cases and everything um, from a Tudor as you would have from a similar Rolex from the era. Now this one's gold plated as you can see. Can you see the difference there where the plating ends and the brass begins? The case itself is actually made of brass. You can see it easily on the crown there. Um, but the plating is worn off on numerous spots but it still doesn't look too bad. And it was advertised as ticking. I bought this one on eBay. And as you can see, it does run for a little bit, but then it keeps stopping. And I'm not really sure why. We'll start by taking off the case back here to look. Whoa, whoa did you see that? Something just flew out of the case. Oh, wow. There is a screw just floating around in the movement here. Take a look at that. That is not normal. Oh. I see what's happening here. This is the winding rotor for the automatic works, but as you can see, there's two parts of it and they're detached and there's another screw. All right, I'm starting to piece together what's going on here. This, These are the screws that actually hold the automatic winding works to the outside rotor there. And I have no, th my only assumption as to how or why this could have happened is somebody tried to fix it and screwed it up because I, th there is just no possible way that all three of these screws, you can see there's two of them already out that I have found. I'm sure that the third one is in here somewhere. It's probably why the watch will stop running, um, but there's no way that those three could have unwound themselves naturally. Uh, maybe one, that, that weird stuff can happen over a long period of time, but three, no way. So it looks like somebody maybe tried to uh, fix this or monkey around with it. And maybe they thought that's how you would take off the rotor. It's not. Uh, that's actually just to be able to replace the rotor itself. That's the outside weight on the end there. So this looks to me like maybe a botched repair job, which <laughs> it can mean we got really lucky and got a really cool watch. Oh, look at that dial. Oh, I love dials like this. They have that Patina, look at that beautiful color that's formed on that dial. I, I live for that stuff. I, I absolutely love it. I know some people prefer it to look absolutely pristine and perfect. Which one are you? You like it to look all perfect or do you like a little wear and a little age on it? I know which one I am. Um, but anyway, it looks like somebody maybe tried to fix this thing and then gave up on it. And again, that can be a really good thing because if all the parts are here, I, I can fix it, I hope. Um. It also, though, means that somebody could have been screwing around in there and breaking stuff, and, and we'll have to keep a close eye out for that as well. So the first thing we'll do before, so, you know, big picture here, we're going to take this entire thing apart today. You can sit down, grab your favorite beverage, and hang out. This is going to be a fun one, because we're going to get to dive in and see why this watch isn't running, and then also try to get it looking and performing as well as humanly possible. It's going to be fun. First thing first is take off the dial, though. That'll let us see the dial side of the movement. This is a Tudor 390. A 390 is a number that most companies will give their movements a movement number, a reference number, or a caliber number, they'll call it. And we can use my uh, cannon pinion removal tool here to remove the cannon pinion. And that's just, uh, you know, they'll track those numbers over time, right? It's, it's, a, it's a model number for the movement. In order to take off this rotor, by the way, we need to remove this funny looking little spring. It holds it in place under tension and this should just lift away. Yeah, it does. So that's the, I guess the decorative part. And then there's the weight that it attaches to. That's the part that the three screws go into that, uh, well, we've got two of them. Hopefully the other one shows up. If not, I'll have to try to track something down online, I guess. I actually don't, maybe a donor movement or something. Similar little uh, spring holder here on top of this automatic winding area as well. This is actually uh, not one of my favorite movements. It's, it's good looking and it actually does work pretty well. But boy, these ones are very tricky to work on. They're not 
watchmaker friendly, particularly, I guess is how I would put it. There's some little gotchas with these movements that can get you and the order that things go in and also are taken apart isn't obvious until you've actually worked on one a few times. Thankfully, I have. Um, for those of you that have been watching my videos for a while, um, if you remember the watch that I restored for Jose, this was a watch, it, is, it was a tribute to his dog, Rosie. Um, that had a very similar movement. I think that was a Tudor 395. This is a 390, meaning it just came out a few years later, maybe with a few tweaks, but it's the same thing. But, you know, as a good example, that one, I got it all running well and everything, and I sent it back to Jose, and when he got it, it wasn't, the automatic winding works wasn't working when he would wear it. It wasn't winding up the watch, so I had him send it back to me, and I had it for months trying to figure out, oh, uh, looks like I've got a little, maybe a little magnetism going here on my screwdriver as well. We'll have to see. Uh, but anyway, I kept wrestling with that thing for months, and uh, I kept taking tries at it and then failing and then having to go back again. It ran fine and you could wind it up by hand, but it just would not, uh, you know, get wound up automatically from the automatic winding works. And I finally figured out what it was. And it was just this minuscule, weird little issue that I just don't know how you would really be expected to figure out without spending the type of time that I did with the movement. And, and again, this is a similar or even the same movement as that. It's just kind of finicky. But that said, when you do get them back together and running and everything, they run really well. So that's the good news. Also good news is that I haven't seen anything crazy on this movement yet. Everything looks to be what I would expect. It's just, it keeps stopping. I still haven't seen exactly why, though. Also, I'm wondering if that other, that third screw from the rotor is somewhere in the movement. And if that's the case, that definitely could explain why it's stopping. And that would actually be the best case scenario too. Okay, we can take out the barrel. Oh, wait a minute. Do you see what I see? Aha, there it is. The third and missing screw. And it was in fact down by the escapement, which is exactly where it would be if it were gonna stop the movement. That is, we may have gotten very lucky here. Um, Again, when somebody describes a watch on eBay as ticking, well, that leaves a lot to the imagination as far as figuring out <laughs> what's actually going on with it. And in this case, it was technically ticking, but it would not keep running. This could be really big though, because I did get this watch for a better price than I would have expected given that diagnosis. And it could be that that was the only issue. Now. Again, it's a little weird that those screws were just floating around in the case. It, it likely means that somebody took them out and just gave up. I don't see any other damage, though. So far, this movement, at least to the initial inspection, looks totally fine. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Definitely in need of a service, however. You can see some of the parts are kind of sticking together. That's a common sign that the Lubricants that it used between them has uh, dried up a bit and that we'll need to uh, get everything all cleaned up. This is the keyless works. This is the part of the watch that lets you wind it and set the hands. Oop. And that's the setting lever right there. Again, it looks fine too. Man, this whole thing looks okay. That's the yoke and the yoke spring coming out now. And there's this little cover plate that covers these intermediate wheels that lead up to what we call the motion works. The motion works are the part of the watch that's responsible for turning and setting, not really setting, I guess. I guess it is setting, setting and turning the hands. You can have a watch that's running perfectly, but if the motion works aren't working, then you can't display the time, and it doesn't matter if the watch is running perfect if it's not displaying the time, right? Okay, I can put the balance back on the movement here. The balance is comprised of that spring, that's the balance spring, the balance bridge, and the balance wheel. And in order for me to run this through the watch cleaning machine safely, I'm gonna put this back on. 
And that keeps everything aligned and together. The problem is really that balance spring. It's also called the hair spring because it's so thin and you don't want it to be floating around. Even, even though in the watch cleaning machine, it is submerged in liquid, you know, which means that it's not getting thrown around super hard. If it gets tangled on something, well, you got big problems then. So you just put it back on. This is the mainspring barrel. This is where the mainspring is housed. This is where the power from any mechanical wristwatch comes from, comes from a mainspring. And that's it right there, all wound up. You can see a lot of stored energy would be held by this thin strip of metal. And there it is. It actually looks really good. And that does look like it has been replaced at some point because mainsprings uh, from this era don't actually look like that. This is a replacement spring from a later date. Now you can see the uh, screwdriver is sticky. The, the screws are sticking to it. And that usually means that it's been magnetized. So I'm gonna put it on my magnetizer, a demagnetizer, sorry. This is actually a, an old school one that I got second hand and that's it all you have to do is put whatever tool it is it can be the tweezers it can be the screwdriver and you just hit the button and it does like an electrical thing underneath and it demagnetizes it and that's it okay these are the reversing wheels for the uh, automatic winding works and they are a pain they've got three little ratchety pieces that have to be stuck on them and they allow those wheels to only turn one direction and not the other and by the way, that was what was wrong with the rosy watch from the other video that I mentioned is that in each case, one of the little tiny pieces of metal that goes on it was upside down. And that's all it took, even though they look like almost identical as each other. Okay, so now we can get this thing ready for the watch cleaning machine. This is, of course, a vital part of the process of servicing a watch. We put it through a chemical process that will strip away, dissolve, and take care of any dirt, debris, dried up oil, or anything else that may have gotten on the movement. So it gives us that fresh, clean start to uh, reassemble. And it also lets us look at the parts as we put them in or take them out of the watch cleaning machine to see what needs to be addressed, if there's any damage or wear. And then it gives us a clean spot to start from when it comes to lubrication as well. So let's take out the crystal here. It's got a little bit of damage on it and I think it's just gonna need to be replaced. I mean, I could technically try to take the buffing wheel to this thing, but it, there's no real point to it. So I'm just gonna take it off. You can see the Tudor logo here on the inside of the case back. And there seems to be quite an old, yeah, dried on by the way, gasket here, but Sweet, it looks like it's gonna come away freely. Sometimes they get adhered to the inside of the case or the case back, but not this time. That will need to be replaced, however, um, as it's gonna lose its ability to remain watertight over time. So we'll go ahead and uh, replace that as well. So now we can set that aside and we can begin the uh, watch cleaning machine procedure here. So the first thing that we'll do is, at, since everything's in this little mesh basket, we can go ahead and uh, put it directly into the cleaning solution. And we run it, I run it for about eight minutes in each of these uh, solutions. This one's cleaning and then it'll be rinsing and followed by another rinse and then a drying cycle. And while our watch is being cleaned up, I did wanna mention that I have a Patreon for my channel. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. Patreon's just a place where you can go to support your favorite content creators. Um, it's a great way for content creators to go directly to the people that love their work rather than having to rely too much on sponsorships or outside things that can be variable, uh, you know, that are not consistent. and. And I found Patreon to be the best uh, for that. So if you'd like to support me on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival, and you'll get a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail, no matter what level you're at. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who supports me on Patreon. It really does mean the world. Now, the, as you can see, this machine is pretty old. Uh, you know, there's a good chance that my watch cleaning machine is older than the watch that I'm actually working on, but it works really well. This is what the parts look like all laid out after having been uh, through the watch cleaning machine. As you can see, quite a bit going on here with this old 1950s Tudor, but uh, it's beautiful. 
All right, now we can start the reassembly process and let's see what we've actually got here <laughs> as far as a, a hopefully running watch will go. First up though, we need to put the uh, mainspring back in the barrel and that means that we're gonna use a little bit of braking grease around the outside edge. This is a specifically formulated grease. It's, a, it's one that is just the right thickness so that the spring can slide around a little bit because it does need to be. Remember, your automatic watch is being wound up as you're just walking around, uh, but not too much. Now I'm gonna put a new mainspring in this watch as well. I was able to find one online. And uh, as you can see, it comes already kind of wrapped up and ready to go with this metal disc around it. And then I can just take this pointer stick and carefully put it into place in the mainspring barrel. Now, a new mainspring is not 100% necessary on all watches, but if you can find one, it is recommended to do so. When you service the watch, it'll keep it running at peak efficiency if possible. Sometimes I won't replace the mainspring for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them may be that I can't find one uh, that, that would fit. Another reason is that if the mainspring's in really good shape, it's just not super necessary. But the third one and the one that probably comes up the most often for me on this particular, uh, on my channel because of how I approach things is, is that sometimes um, the watch is kind of a family heirloom or has a lot of sentimental value. And in those cases, I like to try to keep it as original as I can, even the, including the stuff inside. Of course, I would rather replace the mainspring than have it not work. <laughs> but be original, right? So there's a limit to that. But if it looks like it's functioning fine and everything, I'll just keep the original part. Okay, now we can continue with the reassembly. This is the center wheel. It goes down in the bottom and has its own separate little bridge. As you can see, the center wheel is hollow as well. There's a hole that goes right through the middle of the pivot there, and that is to accommodate the seconds hand pivot. So you know how this watch has a second hand on it and it's in the middle, like most watches these days? That has to have something that the second hand attaches to. And in this case, it's there's gonna be a wheel with a long pivot on it that goes all the way through and it goes through the middle of that center wheel. All right, a little bit of medium viscosity oil here in the middle to make sure that this wheel is spinning freely. And now we can put in the mainspring barrel that we already put the new mainspring into. Okay, so that looks good. Just like to make sure that everything's seated properly. One thing that if you're looking to get into this hobby uh, that you might get caught on every once in a while is this. This is the uh, setting lever screw and you actually have to put it in before you put the barrel bridge on because it goes underneath it and it's an easy one to forget. Also, I should mention if you are looking to get into this uh, watchmaking as a hobby. I highly recommend it. It's been awesome for me. Uh, there's a great feeling of satisfaction when you restore a watch and when you can start getting to the point where you can get onto eBay and start to find stuff like this watch that I'm doing here to restore and bring back to life, get back on your wrist or somebody else's, or you can even try to sell them, you know, after you, you, you've restored them, that type of thing. If you are looking to get into it, I uh, actually started a website called SutcliffeHanson.com with my friend Alex, and one of the main reasons that we started it was because I had the idea that I wanted to make toolkits for people to get into watchmaking as a hobby, and I've got those toolkits there. So I have some entry-level ones, one that comes with a movement that you can use to practice on, and then I even have a more complete and you know bigger sets for when you really get into it. So if you'd like to see what we've got there, we've also got um, pre-owned watches as well as the, some of the watches that I fixed on the channel here and some watch straps as well. It's at SutcliffeHanson.com. There's a link down in the description. And as I mentioned before, this is the, uh, the extended pivot there for the second hand. That will actually go down into the middle. Uh, but first, I actually need to put on the fourth wheel here. But then that other one will go down through the center of the center wheel and, uh, and then that's actually what, you, what we'll end up attaching the seconds hand to as well. As you can see, the, these are a little weird. I have to try to find the bottom pivot hole of this wheel before I can put in this one. Now this is the one that I was talking about. So this one's gonna go all the way through the center portion and down, there we go. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I was just talking about watchmaking as a hobby and the website and stuff and, and how much I, I really think there's a lot of people out there that are intimidated by this. It's so small. I don't think I could do it. Uh, and I, and I disagree. I think you probably can do it and I think you should definitely try it. But I will say this is not the movement that I would start on. <laughs> this is, this is one that might scare you right off of the hobby just because it's such a pain to work on. And, and, you know, even me having worked on it before I'm, st you know, still have to go, all right, this part first, then this part where normally it comes kind of naturally after you've worked on movements for a long time. That's one of the things that people ask a lot is, you know, how do you remember where all the parts go? And, and, you know, if you're just starting off, it does take a little while to kind of build up that muscle, right? But like anything over time, you really do start to get a feel for it and you, it'll become easier and easier. Also, the fact that, you know, so many of us have like cell phones that can take really good quality video or, or photos now means that you really can give yourself a backup plan. You can video or photograph yourself as you go and it'll help you remember where the parts go. Okay, now we can put on the train wheel bridge as we're starting to, get, oh no. <laughs> uh, so I was just talking about it and look, there's this one part of the train wheel bridge that needs to go underneath the ratchet wheel, which I've already installed. Hey, I was just talking about it. I guess I wasn't joking around. So now I need to go back and undo this part just so I can fit this train wheel bridge on. I'm telling you, this movement's just weird. It, it, it always throws these curveballs at me and I always forget one thing or the other, and then have to do this and undo a little bit of work. This, there is a good lesson to be learned here, however, which is that you have time on your side, right? Especially if you're doing this as a hobby. I, it's one thing if you're a professional watchmaker who you know really has the pressure of getting a lot of work done every single day so that they can continue to make the money and pay the bills and all that. But if this is done more in your free time, you know, who cares if it takes you two weeks to put one watch back together? I, w when I first started, I didn't care. I was like, look, my goal is to get this one part, you know, this one section of the watch done today, and hopefully I'll be able to do it. And it's like, okay, if it doesn't happen, you just come back and try it again the next day, right? And you read up and you learn and you ask a question. You watch one of my videos. You just sort of keep plugging away and there's no time limit on it. Uh, and that, that's one of the things that it took me a while to kind of remember. And once I did, it started getting easier for me. And then that started to become less of a problem because I was getting better at it, you know, over time, like anything else. I've also heard a lot of people say that they're worried, you know, that maybe their eyesight isn't good enough, but you know, typically you do use magnification to work on a watch. It's, it's, there's not a whole lot of it that's done with the naked eye. So, you know, if you're comfortable wearing a loop or if you can use a microscope or something, you may be able to, th that might not be an issue for you as well. So don't count yourself out, you know, at least, uh, you know, I get it that not every single person can do this. There are some fine motor skills and things that you will end up needing um, to do, but, you know, uh, give it a try before you, uh, before you count it out, I would say. Okay, keyless works going into place here now that we've got the other side of the movement mostly put back together. I can put a little dot of grease here where the uh, cannon pinion will go on a good sturdy pair of tweezers. We'll click it back into place. It is held on by friction as are a few parts in a watch. It's kind of nice. It means that there's no glues or adhesives that are used, you know, on these watches. So you can just use the tools and the Equipment and stuff that I show on here is really all you'll need. I mean, it's kind of a lot, but it's one of those things also that you build up over time. Okay, now I can take the crown and the stem and put a little of the thicker grease on it. And we'll put that put this in now because it'll help kind of stabilize the keyless works. We've still got more parts to put on for it, but this will hold everything in place. Once we get it aligned properly, there we go. Now we can put the setting lever on. This is what, remember that screw that I told you that people sometimes forget? This is what it screws into. And it gets a little weird because you have to kind of hold it in place with your finger 
and then screw it down from the other side because there's no way to kind of get underneath it without it just falling down. So that can be a little tricky. All right, here is the yoke and the yoke spring. I always recommend using a piece of peg wood or one of these plastic pointers to hold things in place while you manipulate them. If you don't, you do run the risk of it springing away on you, and that happens to all of us, and it can be a real pain. You can end up down on all fours with a, with a flashlight and a magnet. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That, that does happen. I have one here that I use for if I drop a part. And it happens to all of us. Okay. Setting lever spring in place. And remember this little cover. Again, you know, some of these parts have more import, importance than others, right? I mean, they all matter, but like this is just a little brass cover that just keeps that wheel in place. That's all it does. Nothing fancy here. But the screws are very, very small on this one. So I do have to be careful with that. Typically when you're working on a watch as well, you often don't screw down the screw all the way tight on the first pass. You'll often do what I did here, which is do it most of the way, 90%, 85%, and then kind of make sure that everything's lined up properly and then you do the rest. It just is a good habit to be in so that you don't accidentally start breaking things, which can happen easier than you might think. Okay, here is the pallet fork going into place now. And that means that we're just a couple of steps away from the moment of truth with regards to will this movement run properly? I have high hopes for it. I think it was those screws that were loose in the in the movement that was stopping it because as I said, it did tick it did go a little bit. It just would not continue to do so. So it had the capability of running. And my guess is the balance or the pallet fork or the escape wheel just got bumped up against that screw that was floating around in the case and would just stop it. And while I, I, I uh, think that that's what's going on, I also very much hope <laughs> that that's what's going on. Because if so, it means I got a good deal on this thing. Because that's not a hard fix, you know, taking apart finding just finding those screws floating around. And I've had that happen a couple of times on eBay purchases before. It is rare though. You 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 got to get lucky. Usually it's something horrendous. <laughs> a much bigger issue. Okay, let's see if it'll run consistently. A little bit of air. Yeah. Okay, it looks like it's uh, okay, it did slow down a lot. I was going to see, so I blew air on it to see if it would go. And it did kind of tick for a while there, but it does seem to have stopped at this point. Let's see if I can get it running now. Oh, I think it's actually running. Yeah, it looks like we've actually, oh, no, 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 nope, it stopped again. <laughs> Hmm, let's take a look. Uh, so I one thing that we can do here is to oil the jewels. These are running dry and haven't been oiled in a long time. And that means that there's a chance that we just need to lubricate this watch to get it running properly. So let's just do that and see what it does. If it starts to run, run, then we know we're good. And if not, then, you know, we've got more things to figure out. So I'm going to use the lightest viscosity oil. It's called 9010. Uh, it's, it's made by a company called Mobius. And what we need to do is put it on all of the places where there's a metal pivot and a ruby jewel that are met up. When you have uh, something that's very, very hard, like a ruby jewel, that's that's nine on the most hardness scale. That's like one below a diamond. Um, up against something that's a bit softer, like stainless steel is. What ends up happening is, is that you can, if you introduce a, 
a light lubricant, you can create a very, very friction light environment. Meaning that, I mean, this, these things, as long as they're lubricated, run forever like that. And they run very efficiently. I'm going to use a piece of pegwood here to clean the top of the cap jewel. This is a jewel that's designed to hold oil directly above the pivot, but it can actually, the oil can dry on it. And uh, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to use some pegwood, which is just a piece of wood that you can whittle into whatever shape you want to manually clean the top of that jewel, then put it back in the solvent. And now I can take a tiny drop of that 9010 oil and put it right in the center of that cap jewel and then put the jewel setting back on into place, I should say. And with that done, there we go. I can now put it back into the movement as well. And as you can see, while I was gone, take a look behind, that watch is now running. So that's good news. It means that it does look like the uh, oiling was part of the deal there. And uh, well, let's see if it'll kick back up. Yeah, there it goes. Well, okay, it stopped again. But that's actually pretty common when you're working on the top jewel here, it'll kind of slow down. So continuing along with the rebuild here, we need to put together the automatic winding works, which is technically a separate part of the movement, like it isn't necessary to run. But I do want to see if these three screws will actually fit. And I think, I, I believe they actually will. Because again, my theory is not that they came out on accident. I think that somebody took them out because they were gonna try to take this watch apart. And yeah, it looks like I was right. I put those screws back in and it went just fine. So this thing was probably running poorly or had stopped running and somebody took the screws out thinking that they might get going on. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna fix this thing up. And then they went, oh, okay, never mind. By the way, these parts right here, these little tiny metal tabs, these are what I was talking about before. They have to go in a very specific way. If they're upside down, which you can't really tell, uh, then they won't work anymore. <laughs> and that was, an, that, that was ended up being the problem with the, the other watch that I talked about before, Rosie's watch. And again, you know, it works. This movement works, it performs pretty well, but like, look what I have to do. I have to put this thing on and those little parts are suspended in there with oil and they have to be separated out so that these, the under part here engages with them properly and it's just a pain. It's very easy for one of those to fall out or become misaligned. And it just feels like we've progressed uh, technology wise with this to quite a bit better. All right, now we can just put this little cover plate again on. The, this is all, everything I'm working on here is the automatic winding works. And as you can see, it, it's kind of separate. You know, it's not like the watch will run just fine and you can wind it even manually without the winding, automatic winding works. But of course, one of the features of a watch like this is that it winds itself while you're wearing it so that you don't have to do it yourself. And that does mean, by the way, that if you wear this watch every day, or maybe every, like you make maybe maximum two days off, you, it will just stay wound and running. You don't have to set it or anything. And this wheel here is, is also part of the automatic winding works. It's also a big feature of this watch and it's an interesting one because if you've seen some of my other videos one I put up recently, in fact, um, from a JLC watch, it was a bumper movement, meaning that it had a winding rotor, but it, it doesn't fully go around in a 360 degree circle. It kind of goes back and forth and bumps up against some springs. And you can actually feel that happen when, it, when it's on the wrist. It's not super pronounced, but it's there. And that's not a particularly efficient way to do it. It was just the only way that they had at the time. But this is one of the earlier versions of watches that uh, did better than that. And they have the full 360 degree winding rotor, which is what this is right here. And in fact, if you look later, um, you'll see they advertise this on the front of the dial. Like this was technology that they were very proud of. Um, you know, they advertise that it's a rotor self winding so that it goes all the way around, not just a bumper type movement. Getting this little spring on can be a bit of a pain. So I got to get kind of up close and personal, but there we go. 
And as you can see, when I turn it one direction, it winds the watch. And when I turn it the other direction, it also winds the watch. And that is because it has those reversing wheels on it. And that was one of the things that allowed them to do this full 100, 360 degree rotor. So with that done, that means that we can now take a look at it on the time grapher and see how it's doing. As you can see, we've got a really nice amplitude over 300 degrees and very good rate as well. One second, three seconds, zero seconds a day. Super happy with that. So that means the movement is done. But take a look at this case once again. Do you see the difference between the gold plating and the brass that's underneath? The gold plating has that luster and the brass lacks it. It also, as I mentioned before, will discolor over time. So that means that we could leave it, but I think the best case scenario here would be to completely replate it. As I said, I wanna do a full restore. Now, getting out, <laughs> this can be a real pain. We have to take out the case tube, the crown tube. It's the little metal tube that the uh, stem and crown go into in order to replate and, and polish and stuff this case. So I'm gonna use, since this one has no splines or anything on the inside, I read that I could use, it's called an easy out. And <laughs> I'm kind of surprised, but this is actually working. This is made to take out screws that have been damaged and won't come out. And basically it just grabs onto the inside of the case, but it actually worked. So I'm kind of surprised, but I'm kind of happy about it too, because now it means we can continue with the process. Now this is quite a process for me because when I do a case restoration, you know, I wanna try to make it look awesome. And what that means in this case is I need to get this case looking exactly how I want it to look without the plating on it and then do electroplating as well. It is quite a process and you can use uh, a polishing wheel. I also have a Dremel tool that you can use for something like this. But what I found, at least for my workflow, most often I like to use hand files like this. These are uh, a progression of files that are put onto a, a flat piece of material so that you can use you know, one and then the next and the next, and they get finer and finer grain as you go. And it allows you to only take off the minimum amount of material because the issue that you have is you wanna take off the gold plating and then get the surface looking how you want. But if you use a polishing wheel, it's very easy to take off too much, especially because this case is made of brass underneath and it's a soft metal and you can just go right through it pretty easily. So I find, and again, I'm a hobbyist. I can take my time with this. I put on my favorite movie and just kind of go into Zen mode here. But you know, if you're having to do this every day and get a bunch of these things done at once, you're probably gonna have to use the machine. But for me, this is the best workflow. It allows me to have the most control over what I'm doing and I actually have a feel for it now with my hands. The last step that I like to do is use a little bit of, this is called semi-chrome. There's also one called flits that I like. And that just can give that luster to it to kind of see what you've got. And that's what we've got. As you can see, it's a beautiful shiny finish on it um, that we can use as our base to start doing our gold plating from. The interesting thing about this too, there's a couple of things. One, it actually looks really nice in this form, but again, brass won't stay shiny like this. It will uh, react to the moisture in the air, the air itself, and it won't stay that way. The other thing that we have to do, by the way, and the other interesting thing, and this is why I'm using this thermal tape here to carefully tape off the areas I don't want, is that if we do want any type of graining or texture on any part of it, the plating won't really cover that up. It, it is a very thin layer of plating that ends up getting bonded to the metal. And if that's the case, that means you kind of need to have this thing looking exactly how you want it to look before you put the plating on. And so if that's the case, I am gonna very carefully block off the areas that I want to stay shiny and polished. And then there's a little bit of graining that I'd like to have on the lugs, for example, and I'm gonna apply that grain now before we do the, the plating process. As you can see, I've got tape only on the parts where I want to have the polish stay and then the rest of it will be like that. Now, the way that I'm gonna do that is use some Scotch-Brite here and simply drag the portion that I like over the Scotch-Brite and hopefully that'll give me a little bit of a texture on it. I'm not looking for anything deep or crazy, just maybe a little bit of texture to contrast with the polish on the sides. And you can see that here. And now I can do what, the best part, which is take off the tape. <laughs> it's very satisfying. 
You can see the polish underneath and then a little bit of brush finish uh, on the lugs themselves. And that's all we're going for here. It's nothing crazy. Oh yeah, still nice and polished on the sides though. And again, the key here when you're doing electroplating is all in the prep. You have to get it looking exactly how you want before it ends up going into the electroplating plating process or else you'll just carry over any defects. But once you've plated, it becomes very difficult to polish because if you polish too much, you'll remove all the plating and you'll see underneath that you've got brass. So the first thing before we even go to the plating process is I'm gonna run this through the ultrasonic cleaner, some distilled water, a little bit of the cleaner that I use in it, and a full cycle means that this is what it looks like when it's come out. Now, this is the cleaned, ready to be plated version of this, but we will even do more cleaning <laughs> because you really, really need an ultra clean finish before you can actually do the plating or the plating will pick up everything and it won't even adhere properly. So the first step that I'm gonna do for gold plating is I'm gonna use some of this electro cleaner, they call it. So this is a chemical that you put it into and then you do the same thing that you do for electro plating where you use one of these, this is called an anode, this one's stainless steel, and you run current through that anode and also through the metal part and what it'll do is it'll actually, you'll see bubbles, debris, material come off of it as it cleans it. It's sort of the reverse of electroplating. And that's gonna be our first step. Now I put this kind of pill thing in here that you can see. And the reason that I put that in is because it'll agitate the, the liquid so that the bubbles don't stay on the surface and mar it. Now I also need to make sure that I use my little power supply here that is, it's at the correct voltage and current for the step that I'm doing. Now this one requires actually quite a high voltage given the part, it's 10 volts. When we do the actual, actual electroplating, it's much lower than that, but for the electro cleaning process, it is 10 volts to start off with. And you'll see what happens. It's uh, quite a reaction that happens in here. Start by putting the case up against a piece of metal and then we can run the current through. So I'll put the negative charge onto the workpiece, which in this case is our watch case. And then the positive charge will go onto the anode, which is sitting in the same solution as the workpiece. And look what happens. That's right, all these bubbles and chemical reaction and stuff happens right away. And again, that's, you know, the surface of this is being taken away basically and uh, attracted over to the eye, uh, to the anode there. And it should leave us with a surface that is completely free of contaminants. Um, I can put it in some distilled water here just to rinse it off before we do the next step. And anytime you're doing electroplating, it's recommended that you do this in between every step, which is to uh, rinse the piece off in clean distilled water that you've changed out prior. Okay, so now we've got our whole little, you know, science kit set up on the table here. We can go to the next step. Now you might think, okay, cool, let's do the gold plating. Actually, I found it much better if you do nickel plating in between. So this green solution is nickel plating solution and I put another anode in, this one's nickel, uh, as well as one of those mixers down at the bottom. And now I'm gonna set the voltage much, much lower then we had it for the electro cleaning. This one's gonna be ideally somewhere about 1.3 to 1.5 is through my experiments and my work has found that that's what's best. It produces a current that's somewhere around 0.2 uh, going to the workpiece, and that, that's what I found uh, gives me the best results. Now the reason that I'm doing nickel plating first is that the gold will adhere better to nickel than to the brass and the nickel adheres better to the brass than the gold as you may imagine as well. Now you you see that there isn't this crazy bubbling. You can turn up the, the electricity to get it to that point but I found you don't need to and the bubbling actually makes it harder for the, uh, for the nickel to stick to adhere. So let's take a quick look at the case now and it is funny, I always think, I wonder if I should just do it like this. Take a look at it. It actually looks really nice like that. Um, but given the dial and the indices and everything on this watch, I do wanna keep it gold, so we are gonna progress through. But you can change it. Like if you've got a watch that is gold and all the you know, plating's flaking off, you could do it. Now this purple solution 
This is the gold plating. And even though it's a lot more complicated than this, the a way to think about it is that there's nickel and the green, in this case, gold and the purple kind of dissolved into the liquid. And we use this process to have, you know, the gold that's in there adhere itself to the case. And this is the same thing. It's a slightly different voltage. This time it's going to be about three. And what I'll do is I'll let this sit in here for about 20 minutes total. And that gives me a nice uh, solid gold plate. About halfway through, I'll lift it out. There's a little sneak preview there. And I'll turn it around just to make sure that, that uh, both sides of the case are getting fully plated properly. But now that it's done, I can take off the electricity, take it out, and I'll give it a quick dip in the distilled water and uh, we get a little sneak preview there of how the case came out. And then we can take it back to the bench and see what we came up with and take a look at that. How nice is that? A beautiful gold finish on this case. I used 18 karat gold for this, which kind of describes the color mainly, but uh, it looks really, really nice. Now we do need to put this case tube back in and I'm gonna use a little bit of Loctite. There's a couple of different types of Loctite that we use in watchmaking. This is the blue version. And that's really bugging me. There we go. Thank you very much. And it uh, it holds it in, but not forever, right? You you can get Loctite that will basically try to seize the threads of whatever it's on. This is more like, hey, I may want to take this out again someday, but I don't want it to come out on its own. <laughs> that's the level of strength that this Loctite is. And I don't really know what tool I'm supposed to use to put this back in again, because this has a smooth interior. I actually have a tool for the crown tubes that have these splines and it makes it a lot easier. So I'm just gonna use a graver. And yeah, it kind of looks like it chipped away a little bit at the inside, but I mean, it's just smooth on there anyway. So there we go, we've got the case tube back on and now we can take a look back at the movement because we've got a few more things that we need to put together. First, the hour wheel can go into place. And then there's a dial washer that we'll put on as well. And that of course means that we can put this awesome, as you can see, rotor self-winding Tudor Oyster Prince 34 dial back on. And uh, once that's secured, we can turn our attention to the hands, which of course need to be put on as well. I've got this really nice tool for this. Um, there are probably, I would say, three levels of tools when it comes to putting the hands back on. You can actually just use tweezers. It does run the risk of damaging the watch, the hands a little bit or scratching them, so you do wanna be careful. But if it's all you got, that's how people did it for years and years and years. Then they came out with these hand tools, which I also have and use, um, that is just a, a little press that you hold in your hand that has two different size tips on it. But for Christmas a couple of years ago, I got this little thing, which is a press that sort of aligns the dial and then allows you to change out which of the tips you wanna use, and it allows you to get that kind of perfectly straight up and down press. So unnecessary, but uh, <laughs> I love that thing. Okay, now we can replace the crystal on this watch. Uh, as I mentioned before, the crystal did look like it was in pretty bad shape, and I think that this is gonna look really, really nice. I, there's something I really love about the juxtaposition of like a brand new crystal and a case that looks beautiful and replated and shiny and, and great with a dial that has just the right amount of patina, right? There's really something cool design-wise that captures my attention about that. Um, and that's what we're gonna go for here. So we've got this replated case looking great. The crystal looks really nice on there. And then we've got the patina dial. I just love that contrast. And, and uh, we'll see how it comes out on this one. Um, I mentioned before that I needed to replace the back case gasket. So that's what this is here, a brand new one. And then I can use some silicone lubrication there just to make sure that it stays supple and, uh, and does its job. Now we can put the case on. This one goes in like any other Rolex from its time. I mentioned that Tudor is a subsidiary of Rolex and uh, they have the same way to put in the case. And now we can go ahead and put in our new crown. I put on a new crown here as well, but unfortunately the new crown has a much longer inner stem and it means that I actually need to trim down the stem in order for it to fit. So the way I like to do this is to measure how much I need to take out and then I'll take a felt tip pen and mark that off. And then I'll take my end, end cutters here and clip off, leaving some of it. This is 
really critical, right? This, this is one of those times when you definitely don't want to clip off too much. If you do, you got to get a new stem. I it just, it simply won't function anymore if you uh, trim too much of that off. Now, I do like to use a file here to deburr the end, and I can also use it to finely adjust the length. And let's see if this will work now. Yeah, that looks much, much better. And I can secure the stem and make sure that I can get it into hand setting position and back. And with that done, I can now put on the case back as well. You can see the case back is made of stainless steel here. It rubs up against your skin. And uh, wow, look at that. How sweet does this vintage watch look? This is, this is what I was thinking about when I first started looking at vintage watches and wanting to repair them on eBay. This is um, a strap that I'm going to use. This one's actually a 19 millimeter strap. It is handy though. It has, you don't need a tool for it. You know, it has those little uh, quick release spring bars. So you can just throw the strap on and take a look at the finished product here. A beautiful Tudor Oyster Prince 34 from the 1950s. This is exactly what I was dreaming about when I first started restoring watches, that I would be able to pick up something like this off of eBay. This one was about 600 bucks total. Uh, get it fully restored, looking awesome and ready to wear. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I love it that you spend your time with me and I really do appreciate it. Take a look at the final product here. A beautiful vintage watch. If you wanna see more of me, you can find me on Instagram. Um, I am wristwatch underscore revival over on Instagram, and I'd love it if you come over and say hi. And with that, it's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for hanging out, and we'll see you next time.